Salute to Control the Narrative Brand. Thank you guys so much, man. Love it. My favorite, favorite, favorite account to follow, man. Appreciate y'all. I just don't think he has it anymore. Melo's the it. role he didn't want to do. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Control the Narrative. We're on episode 53 now. Um, been a pretty eventful week in Portland Trailblazer world and Carmelo Anthony world, you know, a bunch of games. Uh, Blazers have been playing mediocre. We'll get into that in a second, but um, have a very special guest in the building tonight. Uh, virtually, we have a rapper, a poet, uh, a musical artist, and uh, a fellow Carmelo Anthony fan joining the show tonight. So please welcome Loso to the show. Loso, what's good, bro? Let's do that. What's up, bro? What's up, man? It's an honor. It's my favorite. It's my favorite account to follow, by the way, man. Let's go. Let's go. I literally I felt when I found you guys. I said, "Yo, this is whoever this is is living my life, <laughs> so my life, and he's doing exactly what I wanted to do for a living, bro." And that's just talk about Carmelo. Bro, wasn't it like you felt like it was just you versus the world with all this shit, right? And then you got on. You're like, "Yo, I'm not the and only one." And yo, it wasn't even before. And that's that was another thing. That's another reason why I, I, I love the account because I was like, yo, somebody knows exactly what I'm going through. And so <laughs> it was even before that, though. You know, obviously, Melo in New York, you yeah. know, people are looking at me crazy because I'm like, yo, he's one of the best players in the league. And, you know, obviously, you get the, and we'll talk about the, the false narratives out there. But, uh, but yeah, when you guys came on there and I love the name, I love what you guys were doing, especially when, you know, he was going through everything he was going through. Um, you know, I just, like you, like I said, I, I make sure I run to your account. Even when I miss a game, I run to your account and go, before I go to ESPN, I'm like, all right, let's see what Control says. So. I appreciate that, bro. It means a lot. Um, yo, real quick, let, let's get into like you and shit like that. Um, every time we have a guest on, we ask them to tell us about your basketball fandom. So how'd you start liking basketball? We were just talking a little off camera that, you yeah. know, you were living in Queens for a little bit. So were you a, yeah. a baller growing up? Like, how'd you get into the NBA? How'd you get into Mellow and just all that? Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, uh, growing up playing basketball, um, probably around maybe like 10. So, um, it wasn't like someone put a ball in my hand when I was like four. I don't have that story, but, uh, definitely just obviously being with friends who were playing basketball and me not knowing too much. I was actually pretty big on football at the time, but, um, I started playing basketball and started getting good. I fell in love with it. And so, um, obviously growing up, you know, you have your favorite, my first favorite player in the league was Vince Carter. That was my first, like player that I was like a following and and like how I think of fans like I'm like okay if this person loses or if this team loses does it affect your week and that's what was happening with this Carter like it was affecting me but um but obviously um I, I'm also big on college basketball and um I didn't follow Carmelo in Oak Hill obviously I was hearing about him and uh LeBron nope. James but um but when he got into college though um I was immediately um, intrigued by this player. To me, I tell people every all, all the time, like Carmelo Anthony to this day is the greatest one and done college basketball player. And I put him above Kevin Durant. I put him above a, a, above a, a bunch of people. But I think Carmelo Anthony is the greatest one and done college basketball player of all time. But so um, as soon as uh, he wins the championship for Syracuse and he gets drafted, um, I. I follow Carmelo. So it's not like I'm attached to a particular team. I'm following him. Now I love the NBA. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, you know, even at that time, I'm still um, uh, Tracy McGrady fan. He's out in Orlando. I still follow uh, Vince Carter through New Jersey Nets, but um, Carmelo has my attention. And so, you know, um, during the whole nuggets, I'm, I'm, I feel like he was robbed a rookie of the year. You know what I'm saying? I feel like um, people don't talk about how he was making the playoffs in the West um not just his first year but you know year after year after every that. year uh, yeah you know what i'm saying and then you know he runs into prime kobe obviously you know like you can't really fault Melo, who really fought hard that whole series but he runs into prime kobe at that time yep. and then you know he goes to new york and when he went to new york obviously me being born in new york um that was like a dream come true you know what i'm saying i got the root mm -hmm. for the knicks and Melo at the same time and so um to this day, that that 2000, uh, I believe it's 13, 14. Was it 2013, 14 when it became 12, 13? Okay, got you. When when they were second seed in the East, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got you. Yeah. So um, that was that was one of the greatest seasons I was able to witness. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
up and down the roster. And then you got to think about it. You have Miami, uh, who was who was loaded, obviously, with LeBron, Dwayne, and Chris Bosh, and Melo Stain, you know, solo out there. Uh, what he did that year was like that. That threw my fandom to another another level. And so I was following her on the way. But um, even moving forward, I mean, you can attest to this. Like when you're a Carmelo Anthony fan, you just have like people who may not even dislike Melo, but they just for some reason want to go ahead and bring up these negative false narratives, bro. And you're no, looking at no. and you look crazy because it's like, yo, why are you a Carmelo fan? You could be such and such such and such. But um, but man, you know, I. All throughout the way, bro. I mean, when he when he left New York and went to Oklahoma that once that first season, I promise you, this is not an exaggeration. I watched every Oklahoma City game, bro. <laughs> I watched every Oklahoma City game. I made sure I got because I you know I live in Tampa, so I made yeah. sure I got the uh, NBA package. I, I had to add NBA t- TV because for some reason NBA TV does not come with the NBA package, so you had to get that. And so okay. did that, and then uh, he goes to Houston. Obviously, that ends, you know, that ends in hell, yeah. and, and and you know, he ends up getting blackballed. And then when he goes to Portland uh, last year, um, I watched every Portland Trailblazer game, bro. This year, I've actually been slacking in the beginning of the season. Uh, I missed a couple, but but yeah, man, it, it goes there. You know, obviously, I, I played uh, high school basketball. Um, uh, two years of varsity out there. I played a little like uh, it's like a small college out here, and then you know, I still. Still running hoop. I try to play at least twice a week, but you know, life life keeps you busy. But right. other than that, man, yeah, I love it. Respect. So loyalty from day one, it sounds Syracuse day, day one. Day one, bro. Uh real quick, I, I always ask people this because I'm always curious because I feel like it's always something different. What about Mellow or like his game drew you to him so much? Was it like his handles as a six eight? Do was this his shooting? Was it like what was it about him that you were like? I think shooting. Um so for me. You get this guy who was, and so uh, you know what it was, too, man. Um, I, I've never been an anti-LeBron guy, right? Like I'm, I, I'm I a, I appreciate LeBron um, and what he's done. I've never been a, a LeBron fan, but I've never been anti-LeBron. Like I've, I've always acknowledged mm-hmm. his greatness. But I think one of the biggest things was that I had, you had this other guy, bro, on the West Side, on the Western Conference, and he was about the same size. And if, and when they went head to head, I was like. Yo, are y'all watching what I'm watching? Because he's giving LeBron buckets, bro. Like, very, very bad. Like, Carmelo Anthony, I mean, uh, LeBron James and Kobe Bryant have went on records and said, Carmelo is the toughest player for I mean, toughest player for me to guard. Paul Pierce yep. has went on record and said that. And so I think it was a combination of the shooting, but then also this bully ball, bro. Like, he can get in the paint. He can post up. He can he can do dirty work. And um, and just that, I mean, just that one season, bro, that like we said 2012, 2013, people don't – I'm sorry, it was here after that when they started going down. But he was going to be the first player since Shaq to average 28 and 9, bro. And, like, that's from a guy who you wouldn't consider, like, a, a big, big dude. But he just – just yeah. Player. So that's the type of game I love, though. Respect. It's, it's, it's always like that. It's like, you know, people look at LeBron and, like, I'm an anti-LeBron guy just because my brother is two, is younger. So, like – I picked Melo when we were younger. He picked LeBron, so we've just always been going at it. And like, yeah. I think I think you can imagine how those kind of arguments always have ended with like him winning it. Like, what the <laughs> fuck can I say and shit like that? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But just like, yeah, he was always kind of the other guy. And like, when you would watch him versus LeBron, him versus like whoever, he yeah. always just never, never, you know, back down to the challenge. He always rose up to the occasion and just, yeah, yeah, he, he's just always been underrated and just like yeah. underappreciated, really. Steve, even when he had the opportunity, man, to go ahead and, and join forces with other people or team up, like, we don't give him enough. Even even the drama that you see today, right, like with this whole James Harden Houston thing, like, Melo didn't do that once in New York. He didn't he didn't come out on Twitter. He didn't do no post interview, none of that, and slander Phil. He didn't do any of that, bro. And Never. so – we don't so now what we kind of like killing Kyrie for and killing Harden for and killing all these other players for it's like y'all didn't praise a guy a superstar who easily could have went you know to other teams he could have went to Chicago which a lot of people I felt like he should have went to Chicago you know what I'm saying but him staying in New York I think like he doesn't get praise enough for that and even dealing with all of those different struggles even the whole throughout the whole Houston Rocket thing um but yeah man I you know I, that just comes to the territory. Like, like I said, it yeah. comes to the territory with this guy because he's quiet 
and he doesn't speak out, unfortunately, that lets the media, and he said this himself, he let, lets the media and lets the fans exactly. uh, create this false narrative. Exactly. Yeah, great point. Uh, all right, let's fast forward to this season. Well, the last two seasons. Um, you know, we're like, what, I think like 12, 13 games into the Blazer season. Yeah. They, they just lost today. We're recording this on Monday. Uh, what have you seen this season? Because you say you watched every game last year, mm -hmm. the Blazers game. So what have you seen this season uh, that has been different, the same? Like, what can you compare about Melo this season, his role, his game, like how he's performing, all that shit from this yeah. season compared to last season? Man, I think, and and if you watched him or if you watched like certain videos through the off season, you knew he was like he had something to prove. I think you know, obviously there were questions if he was going to get re-signed or not, or where yeah. he was going to end up at. So he had to make sure that yo, what I did in the bubble was not fluke. But um, he was working on his stamina, bro, and he was working on his body. And he, I think, like this might be some of the like the the best in shape that he's been in in a while. And so if you watch him this year. That's translating. Now, granted, he's not playing as much minutes. He's not starting and stuff like that. But you are seeing these hustle plays. Now, if you're just talking about offensively, to me personally, I'm, granted, he's averaging 12. He's, you know, he's coming off the bench. But I think he's I think he's doing exactly what he was doing in the bubble. I think he's doing exactly what he was doing when he came to Portland. Um, a little more efficient in my eyes. I think um, he's not settling as much as obviously when he came in, you know, taking these long uh, – not not three pointers, right? He's taking these long oh, yeah. like mid and, and and long two pointers or whatnot. That this day and age doesn't necessarily. It's like okay, you could have gotten a better shot, but at the same time, um, I don't okay. necessarily see a drop off where a lot of people thought like, yo, that was like a one hit wonder thing. I'm seeing Melo uh, attack. I'm seeing Melo one obviously know his role. Like he's like, hey, I, I told you guys, I can come off the bench. I can give you 12, 13 a night. Um, what he's doing. And um, I'm really happy about that. You know what I'm saying? I, like I said, what, what people thought was they were going to see a drop off. I'm actually seeing the players that are saying, hey, whenever you need me, I, it's, it's just an opportunity. And that's that's what right. I'm getting pissed off about this season. He's not getting the opportunities, even though he's delivering every time. Yeah. Uh, I think the same exact thing. Like, he's not really playing different in terms of like his style. Uh, he's performing like similarly. Again, we're like fucking 12, 13 games in. But, yeah, it's just about opportunity. It's just about, like, touches. It's about minutes and shit like that. And if he was playing, I don't I don't have the numbers on him, but if he was playing more minutes like he was last year, I'm sure that 12 points per game would be fucking 17 or whatever, 16, yeah. whatever it was last year. So, yeah, last year, right? Yeah, I think he had 16.7. I could yeah. just be pulling that on my ass. I don't know. But it's around 16, 17, yeah. So I think it's, I think it's just that, like, same style. Um, they're relying on him late in the, in the fourth to hit those spot-up threes, which – Again, you have they have to get him in rhythm before they just start fucking passing it to like he's not a spot up shooter, so he needs that to be in rhythm before he gets that. So I think that's been important, but um, honestly, like not a ton. Like like you said, just the, the opportunities, the touches. I wish we would see more of it. To be honest, I thought because that first preseason game they came out, well he came out and he dropped like fucking twenty something. Like I was like, yo, six men of the year. Like let's go, here we go. Like this is gonna be dope, and he's gonna be the guy off the bench and. Hasn't really been like that this season. Rodney Hood's been struggling. He just balled out today. But, yeah, yeah man, I, I think it's the same thing. I think it's just less touches. So, obviously, when you have less touches, you're not going to be as productive in terms of points and shit. But uh, percentages, like career high uh, from three this this year. And, again, I'm going to say it again, 12, 13 games. But I think he's shooting like 43% from three, which is crazy oh. efficient. So, um, yeah, I agree with you there. Mm -hmm. um, let's get to the big men. Uh, since we recorded last week, Nurkic broke his wrist out for about two months. Um, just straight up, how comfortable do you feel with the bigs they have right now? Cantor, Harry Giles, Mello, Covington. I guess those are like the four main bigs, unless I'm forgetting yeah. somebody. But I feel like those. So how do you feel over the next two months with with those four guys in the front court? Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, bro. See. <laughs> So I'm <laughs> not gonna be. Now. That's not gonna be good. When you gotta start, I gotta be honest. That's not gonna be good. If you just ask me about Cantor and Giles, bro, I don't feel comfortable, bro. I don't feel comfortable. I'm gonna tell you why though. Forty percent of it is personnel. Forty percent of it is because of them, right? But I'm gonna get on them in a minute. The other part though is that Nurk is Nurk. You know what I'm saying? Like going into this season, everyone was like, okay, 
We saw what Portland did. They were able to kind of gel a little bit in the bubble. You know, obviously they went they went against the Lakers team who, who ended up uh, winning the championship. But you have Dame, you have CJ, uh, you got a healthy Nurk. Healthy Nurk was the big big deal. And obviously you add Covington, you add uh, Jones, you add all these other players and whatnot. And then you you, you resign Melo. Um, here's the thing though. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna keep it a thousand with you. Nurk going down to me at watching Portland. Nurk going down is the second most devastating thing that could have happened to Portland outside of Damian Lillard, and that's even more than CJ McCollum, who I think is probably gonna miss what a week now. Yeah, like a week or two. Yeah, something like that. To me, Nurk going down is more devastating than Damian Lillard because it turns us from like this two-dimensional team to a three-dimensional team. You know what I'm saying? Like, Nurk does add this, even though he's not, like, going crazy in these first 13 games, he adds this other versatility and this big man that can knock down a, a baseline jumper, this big man who can post, he can rebound, he can pass, he can Absolutely. do all these, all these things. He's an elite big man, you know what I'm saying? But when you come in, and this is why I'm going to get to Ennis Canther and, uh, and Harry Giles now, when you bring them in, bro, it's such a drop-off. It's not like last year we didn't give Hassan Whiteside enough credit. I the know, man you're right. in and let the league in blocks. You're you know right, you're right. Like, yeah, you know, Whiteside gets a lot of like bad rep or whatnot. But my thing is like, yo, you watched a lot of Portland games last year. I watched every single one. Hassan Whiteside was hooping and and we didn't think that was gonna happen. But now watching these guys, I mean, and it's cancer to me. I mean, he's going to have some games when, you know, he's going to – I think he's a double-double machine, right? He can get you 10 and 10, um, but you need more than that. You know what I'm saying? You need some 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 other plays besides that, and it, especially with CJ going down. Um, I don't know what the Portland Trailblazers' plan is. Me personally, and I know a lot of people watching this are going to think I'm, I'm biased. Yo, you got to plug Melo back into the starting lineup somehow. I know you guys are thinking – but but this is, this is just what we're – Unfortunately, this is where we're at. Like, yes, Cantor has to go in there because you need a body against some of these bigs or whatnot. But Melo has to get put into the mix because he opens up the offense so much. Right. And, um, you know, unfortunately, man, like I said, with with, with Nick, with, with Nurt going down, uh, it just sucks. And I don't necessarily feel comfortable. However, though, there's not a lot of guys they could pick up, though. I think John Henson is the only guy who's who's probably available to pick up. And that's not getting any better. So you got to yeah. stick with these two guys. But uh, we'll see, man. Hopefully they could they could keep their head above water. Yeah, great point. I think uh, the most important thing you said was, besides Melo starting, uh, was uh, yeah. like Nurkic just – he adds a different dimension to the offense. He, he's just like they have to game plan for him. Like, of course, you have to yeah. game plan for, for Cantor too. But like you said, man, that dude's a playmaker. He can hit shots. I feel like even that game, he was starting to feel more comfortable. I think he'd hit a, a three or two, two three or some shit like that. So – like you said, he wasn't balling out this year, but just the dimension that he adds to that offense. And even in the starting lineup, Dame CJ, obviously, when CJ is going to be back in a few games, hopefully. Uh, Derrick Jones Jr., not a great shooter. Covington has been struggling. Cantor can't shoot. So now the defense can just focus on Dame and CJ and, like, just drop off everybody else and, and clog the – well, not drop off everybody, but, you know what I mean, cheat and shit like that. So yeah. it's not good. I don't, I don't feel comfortable either. Um, I really want to see more out of Harry Giles just because I feel like he has so much potential. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I want to see more out of him, especially on the defensive end, because like Cantor's going to come and put up 10-10, like you said, no doubt. Yeah. But, you know, on the defense and today he was terrible. Like I had just given him props last week. I literally just posted the video. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I literally just posted the video yesterday on Twitter and Instagram. I was like, all right, man, I got to gotta give Cantor his props. And then he goes out and like every play, the Spurs were going at him, and uh, Jacob Podol or uh, whatever his name is uh, was was going off. I think he only had like ten points or some shit, but he was just causing havoc down there. So I agree. I do not feel comfortable. I would like to see some change because that starting lineup of Dame, CJ, Derrick Jones, and Covington was put out there with Nurkic at the five. So Nurkic and Cantor, totally different players. Like Nurkic isn't going to play fine. Like. You know, Derrick Jones and Covington aren't superstars. We're like, no, you can't take them out of the starting lineup. Like, in yeah. my opinion, starting Melo at the four and then maybe putting a guy like Giles in at the five. So yeah. you still have some de more defense than Cantor. You have shot making. And I don't know. 
Um, that's what I think would be a pretty good look. But yeah, man. And, and it's like, and you and I are saying this, and it's like, yo, how does nobody else? <laughs> like, this is this is easy mathematics. And you know, what's crazy though, you know who agrees with us? Who? Every other every other coach in the NBA, because when they play Portland, like. There's a reason why when Melo gets the ball in the post, right, they're sending another defender towards this 36-year-old guy, right, because they know, yo, that's the highest, probably besides whatever shot Dane takes or CJ when he's on fire, that's the highest percentage shot that Portland has right now. You throw it at, you throw it in Melo in the post and you let him cook. He's going to get the foul. He's going to end one. If he doesn't settle, right, he's going to be able to go ahead. He gives you a little jab step and he's going to knock that shot down. Yep. You don't have it with those other guys. You know what I'm saying? And you're going to need some offense right now. And especially with CJ out, bro, they're going to be treating Damian Lillard like they did uh, last year. You know what I'm saying? Meeting him at half court. They're going to yep. treat him like they're like treating Curry right now. Like, you have to go ahead and figure what else can. And I like Giles, too, because he's athletic. He's He he, he moves around. Like, I, I love that type of energy as well. And I think that can provide – a different type of spark than what cancer is given, but you got to try yeah. something. I know for real. Uh, and then also real quick, just want to get this on record, but uh, Portland's backup point guard position with CJ out, I feel like it's kind of a big deal and fuck it. Let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, yeah. The backup point guard spot, because usually Dame or CJ are usually always on the court for like 95% of the time, whatever. And yeah. for the time they're not, Anthony Simons is running point. I, I don't fuck with him at all, but, yeah. Especially with CJ out now, this offense, I think Simons can't run the offense. Like, who else is going to run the offense? Run it through Melo. Like, yeah. whether it be him, you know, running pick and rolls, whether it be in the ISO in isolation and two guys come. Like, the Pacers were literally double teaming him every single time he touched the ball. So oh. go that route and let him find the open man, a couple skips, whatever. So I think that's going to be uh, over the next, like, week, two weeks max, something to yeah. really look at. Uh, is is who runs this this offense when Dame isn't out on the court and like Simons is not it. That dude is a fucking chucker. He does not pass the ball for shit. Um, so Yo, real quick, is, I would give you. I would say this about Simons. So last year when I was watching him, um, there was this uh, like I had this small excitement for him on the court because he can jump right. Like uh, um, and he wasn't afraid to go ahead and shoot. And I thought he was running the same issue. That what what you and I are saying right now with Melo, yo, when you put Simons in, he obviously is coming in to relieve Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum, mm -hmm. but he has to get in some sort of like um, progression, like some sort of momentum or whatnot. So he has to shoot something because he's right. been sitting ice cold on the bench. Now you're right, bro. I, like unfortunately, he's like it's such a huge drop off. It's the same thing with Nurk. Nurk going down to Giles or Cancer, like. It's like, all right, bro, what are we going to do? <laughs> CJ McCollum going down. CJ, bro, CJ's averaging 27 yeah. right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Literally averaging 20. So, like, like my thing is, like, you're not going to get that from Simons or whatnot, but you do need some sort of, like, assertiveness, aggressiveness. Obviously, Gary Trent is going to come in and try to do something. But, yeah, um, but yeah I, I feel the same way, bro. Like, it's kind of it's kind of iffy on that. But I do love the idea, like, yo, Throw it in, throw, yo. Let Melo go ahead and get this high post shot. Let's go ahead and and start at the top of the key. Like he's knocking down shots at three. Like you have another weapon out there. Yeah, or let him handle it too. Run a couple yeah. of pick and rolls. He's a he's a more than capable passer. So you've seen him. You've seen him like grabbing a rebound and just running the offense. He's trying yeah, to he tells people like, let's go. Like I got it. Why are we gonna waste time? Yeah, yeah. Fuck with that. Yeah. Um. Let's talk about Jones Jr. and Covington. Uh. Both not having great seasons offensively. Derrick Jones, we kind of expected that. But Covington is, I think he shot like, what, one for 10 or some shit the other game? Like, not good. And can you imagine if that was mellow? Like, it, it'd be over. But uh, my question that I was thinking about, I want to know your opinion. At, one point, at what point is the defense that both Derrick Jones Jr. and Robert Covington provide worth the terrible offensive numbers? So obviously, like, there's no, like, oh, at this point. But, like. How bad the, do the offense does the offense has to, have to get, um, you know, in order to kind of justify their defense? Um, does that I make sense? That, I feel like I feel like, like it does. I say this, bro. <laughs> what we're seeing now, right? Like this lack of offense. The re the only way it's going to pay off, 
and it's not it's not going to be now. It's not going to be so. They I think they have about I think Portland has about twenty five uh, more games before um, like the halfway point or whatnot. But mm-hmm. and I and I think Nurk is out. How long you said two months? Like two months, yeah. Two months, right? That that defensive lineup, that Covington and Jones lineup, bro, not into the playoffs. When we when we're in the playoffs and you go and you lock in on a team, right? Let's say like they lock, they let's say let's say Portland gets um uh with the Mavericks, right? Okay, cool. Now we need to go ahead and game plan for these guys like like Luca and them, or you go against Utah, right? And we need to go ahead and game plan against Donovan Mitchell for the next two weeks, right? Like that's when I'm okay with you know what. We only have Dame out there. We got CJ out there. I understand us banking on Covington and Derek out there. That's cool. But right now, that's not like it's not like we've tried it for 13 games. It's just not it. I understand this man is a high flyer, bro. And yeah, there's some cool putback dunks that he's doing. But that's it. Like how many <laughs> how many of those are, are, are people really not going to box out and give him? You can't count right. on that play that you draw. Up. He just It's just right time at the right place. Yeah. And so – I don't think that you I don't think that we're gonna really like um appreciate this new defensive like uh, uh lineup that they're trying out into the playoffs. And and when you have to lock in on certain perimeter players, when you have to lock in on certain guys who are driving to the bucket, then yeah, you know what I'm saying? I Nurk will be back and then you have Covington, you have Jones, and so I I I, I look forward to that. But right now, bro, in my opinion, that's just not it. Fair. That's fair. Uh, my whole thing is like, obviously we t- we talked about it a little bit before when, you know, they can just fucking send four guys if they wanted to at Dame. <laughs> like, if Derek Jones Jr. can't hit, if he hits one out of every four three, is like that's that it's just not yeah. it. But um, it's just about like adjustments for me. It's like mm-hmm. obviously now CJ isn't out there. You put in Gary Trent. I like Gary Trent a lot on both ends. I think he, he's a great defender and like he hits his shots. He can even get his own shots sometimes too. Um, but when a guy like CJ goes out, when a guy like Nurkic goes out, like it just allows the defense to only focus on Dame. Like the coach should adjust, mm-hmm. put another playmaker out there with them. Gary Trent a little bit, but like put Melo out there with them and like yeah. start the game, right? Start the game. If you find that like they're double teaming Dame at halftime or, you know, Derek Jones Jr. Just can't hit a shot right now or Covington is off for the night, like adjust. They, it's like. They they wait until six minutes at the very very earliest to put Melo in. It's like adjust. If some guy isn't have it, like you could tell, adjust. Take him out. Put Melo in. If yeah. Melo isn't doing well, or like if all of a sudden, you know the other team is going crazy hitting every single three, take some take an offensive guy like Cantor out. Put so it's just about adjustments, and I just feel like the the coaching staff is just so stuck on this lineup, and it's not working. So if it's not working, like try something else and they just don't seem willing to at this point. And 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 I'm pretty sure it's because of last year, right? But my thing is like if you're basing this lineup on what happened last year, two things. One, you know, that that lineup that we end up seeing going to the bubble, I mean, they were making things work on the fly, right? And they were going against some teams and yeah, they were they were giving up a lot of points. They were putting up a lot of points. They were end up winning. Okay. And then then they went up against the Lakers. Like, the Lakers ended up winning the whole thing. So, like, that's not a good rubric to go ahead and use and say, man, you know what? We got to go all in on defense, and we'll sacrifice some of the points that we weren't scoring. Nah, like, mm-hmm. you know, there was a reason why Gary Trent was coming off the bench and lighting it up. There was a reason why Melo in the starting line was able to give you 16, 17, 18 points, and then he'll give you the occasional, yo, you know what? I'm just hot today. He goes 25, 26. Like, there's a reason why that was happening. On top of Dame losing his mind, on top of CJ still being clutch, like, that's that's there, bro. And my thing is, like, that was working. I understand. And so if it was me, this is what I would say, bro. I'll go ahead and get on my little, little high. If it's me, bro, right, I'm I'm putting Melo back in there. I'm letting the offense flow. And obviously this is healthy, healthy CJ, healthy Nurk, right? Letting the offense flow through Dame. Put, you know, they're, they're dumping it off to Melo. Let him get his shots. Nurk is in the middle. And then let's say there's a defensive assignment that we're just not hitting on. We're getting exposed. Cool, you have Covington. You have you have Jones. And like you said, bro, this it's not like we're asking Kevin Durant to come off the bench. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's freaking Covington. You know what I'm saying? Hey, come off the bench, bro. Like, 
come over here and do what you need to do. And so, you know, unfortunate, unfortunately, like we haven't been seeing him, but fortunately it's only been 13 games, like we said. So I know you've been writing a lot in your posts, like, okay, we're not going to hit the panic button. We're not going to hit the panic button. <laughs> I'm right. with you. Like, right, yo, we're not going to hit the panic button. But uh, but my hand is kind of like, you know, waving over the panic button right now. It's just like, all right, I don't yeah. know if it's a panic button or the piss button, but one of these guys are going to get pressed, bro. Fair. That's fair. Um, yeah, man, I, I agree with that. Uh, kind of on a similar topic, and, like, this might be correlated to it, but is Dane playing up to your expectations so far? And if not, if he is, then, like, you don't have to answer the second part, but if not, do you think it has anything to do with the people playing around him, the starting lineup specifically. Yeah, um, it's hard. It's hard to um, like give an honest answer based on what I've seen so far. So because it's it's like yes and no, he is right. So like last year, he's hooping, right? I mean, he's he's going crazy, MVP consideration, right? And then he's definitely was the MVP in the bubble. So this year. It's easy for us to say no because we haven't been hearing a lot of storylines. Right. But man, is averaging 28 points a game. He leads the freaking league in the most 30 point games. You know what I'm saying? That's quiet. Like, like <laughs> you and I would be like, yo, Dane, you gotta step it up. And Dane's like, yo, I lead the league and I have the most 30 point games this season. <laughs> yeah. 28. On top of that, my Batman is averaging 27. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like Dane has to do it all because CJ has been playing out of his mind so far in my opinion or definitely above what i expected him to do cj mm -hmm. cj but um but he has some games where he's like yo he's killing you know just the other night damian little was like yo we the best backcourt in the nba which i agree with him um so i i say i say i do think that some of the people around him um doesn't necessarily allow him to be as free as he was when he had other offensive weapons on the court with him. Yep. On the flip side, I do think that Damian Lillard has been still killing it though. Like I haven't been seeing like a a, a decline with his game. Uh, like I just said, the, the couple of stats that I just brought up, I think he's averaging like 28. I think he's – obviously, he's definitely leading the league in the most 30-point games. But um, we'll see. We'll see as we move forward. And I'm very interested to see – um oh or not obviously we won't be able to see but i'm very interested to know if lillard is pushing like the agenda as far as like oh let's try something else you know what i'm saying like right now for the next two weeks you don't want to go ahead and get five on a five six game losing streak or something like that that'll really hurt your seating chances yeah. in the beginning i would have thought yo portland was going to be a uh, portland has a good chance to be a three seed me you too know what I'm saying? we'll see right now like now it's like, yo, we're gonna get a six, a seven, an eight. You don't want to get those. Work. You you definitely don't want to get eight. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that that was my that's my opinion on, on Lillard so far this year. All right. Uh, the one thing you said that stuck out to me was um, talking about how uh, you know they just they lost to the Lakers in the playoffs. The Lakers yeah. won the championship. So for that to kind of be, and I don't even know if that was you know, in, in your answer to this question, and maybe it was the one before, but I'm just thinking about that now. Uh, them losing to the Lakers and that being like the, we need we need to hit the reset button, like we need to bring more guys and we can't go with this. It's like, they went six and two in the regular, uh, the bubble games, the seeding games. They went one and zero in that wild card game. They went one and zero in the first round and then obviously lost four in a row. But um, I, I think for that to be the kind of reasoning behind you know, oh shit, like we got to blow this up or like we got to completely change it. It's crazy. But yeah. as far as far as Dame goes, yeah, to be honest, I just looked it up. He's averaging like 20, uh, 28. Um, I think it was seven and five or four or some shit like that. So like you can't really ask more. I guess for me, bro, I just had such high fucking expectations because in the yeah. bubble, like he went off like that. So I guess like I was like, all right, well, you know, you bring in more people like, they were fucking starting. Uh, what was that dude that was starting versus the Lakers? The tall dude, um, Wenyan Gabriel. Like, he was doing that with Wenyan Gabriel in the starting lineups. So I was like, all right, bro, if you could do that with Wenyan Gabriel, like Robert Covington, and like, they're going to be fine. So I guess I just like had such high expectations for him. But I, I think it just goes, you know, to show that when you 
have guys out there who are not an offensive threat, who can't get their own shot, who can't play make, who can't hit open threes and shit like that, it makes your job so much more difficult. And like, not saying that he's not. I think he literally just won play, uh, Western Conference Player of the Week. They announced that today. So, you know, n- not n- this question really wasn't like, is he not playing up to expectations? But like, almost is he being limited? I guess that's a, that's a better yeah. way to put it. Uh, and I, I I feel like he is being limited even at 28, 7, and 5, whatever the fuck he is, just because, like I said, man, Derek Jones Jr. spotting up from three is is not going to scare a lot of teams out there, and they could send that guy over. And um, now with Nurkic going down, they got to figure something out. They got to adjust, and, uh, you know, we'll see what the fuck happens. I hope they do, man, because it is weird because in the Western Conference so far, I mean, you really just have the Lakers that are kind of just setting themselves apart. Right, because even even the Clippers, I mean, they're probably like what, all right. nine and four. I mean, they you know Paul George looks good or whatnot, but like everybody else, like even the Spurs, like the, like they lost to the Spurs, but they have the same record, right? They have the same record, both uh, eight and six, I think. And so now moving forward, they're gonna go ahead and test the waters, and they're gonna see, okay, let's see what we can do with these other guys while Nurk is CJ out a little bit. And uh, unfortunately, though, if they stay in the same position, there's not going to be a lineup change. I almost want them to kind of like get shook a little bit, get scared a little bit, drop maybe another game or two. And then, you know, they, the coaching staff starts looking like, OK, cool. We got to make an adjustment because I think that's what needs to be made anyway. Even if yeah. you're beating, you know, the Pelicans or, or the Magic or something like that, because you got to understand, like, yo, are we are we competitive enough to go ahead and, and go four, five, six games with the Clippers and the Lakers, or or can we go ahead on on a you know on any given night and beat the Nets and beat Milwaukee or something like that? Like, do we have the personnel to do that? Do we have the coaching staff that can go ahead and put a lineup out there and do that? And um, unfortunately, I don't I don't believe we do right now. But uh, but if they make some adjustments, I do think, man, that the team is talented when healthy. I do th- I do think that they are talented enough to compete with anyone, and that's yeah. I mean. And that's the that's the most frustrating part about it. And like as you said, like you hope they lose a the game, bro. I swear to God, I was watching the game today. I had a couple of friends over and shit. And when they take like Melo had just hit a three. It was like in the fourth quarter, like kind of in the beginning, and Melo mm-hmm. hit a three, and then they put in Covington and. Uh, and Derek Jones Jr. and like this, I probably shouldn't be saying this out loud, but I was like kind of hoping that like the yeah. other team like went on a run or like whatever, just to be like, yo, like what the fuck are you doing? Like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I, I don't know. I probably shouldn't be saying that. Like, obviously, we're rooting for the Blazers. And she's like that. I'm not a Blazers fan, but I'm rooting for them because Melo's on the team. So it's frustrating, man. It, it's just frustrating because you know you would think that eight and six, it's not bad. Like when I was in here, like pushing the panic button, even though you said. You had your hand over it. We're not pushing the panic button or something yet, but like, what is it going to, I think the question is, what is it going to take for them to be like, all right, like we got to figure shit out. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It might and, be like a three game losing streak. We don't know. Yeah. And see, when did, like, this is, this is my only thing, bro. When did, um, Derek Jones and Covington become these, Perennial defenders, bro. When did they become Kawhi Leonard and Paul George? I know. That, like, we played the freaking Spurs, and the Spurs dropped 125 on us, bro. And Rudy Gay's out there looking like he's back in Memphis. And 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 Patty Mills giving you 21. You know what I'm saying? And DeMar DeRozan giving you 20. Hey, those are guys that Covington and, and Jones, like, those are the guys that you put out there to go ahead and slow those guys down. I understand LaMarcus Aldridge, you know, lighting us up. Like giving us, or you know, giving us twenty two or whatnot. Like I can understand that, right? But my thing is, like all of the other guys, nah. Like there's no reason why we're losing games with Demar Derozan, Rudy Gay, and Patty Mills combined for over you know sixty five points. Like there's just no reason for that. And so, yeah. if we're only putting up one four and we're losing, you know, and another team's putting up one twenty five, all right, you know what? I got to start giving some, some of these other guys some minutes. And Melo's not afraid. You know, two for three for three point. You know what I'm saying? He, he gives you 14, 14 points. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand like what the plan moving forward is. And um, you know, I like I, I agree with you, man. It's like I, I hope something uh shakes them up. Or I hope they're having conversations like, okay, we need to go ahead and adjust right now. Yeah. Yeah, man. We'll see. Uh and I'm just I'm looking at today's box score too. 
four 20 point scores for the Spurs DeRozan, Aldridge, Rudy Gay, Patty Mills. Um, and you know, this, like you said, the defensive superstars, I think it's so funny because, like, just the way it feels like the Blazers look at them is like, oh shit, we got to shut somebody down. Let's put in Derek Jones. And like, and it, it's hard, like, it's, it's hard to guard a lot of these players. Like, we're not sitting here and be like, yo, they should finish the game with 10 points if they're that good or fit, whatever. But like, for Rudy Gay to put up 21 off the bench, for Patty Mills to put up 21 off the bench, for like some of these, some of these other guys that we have watched, and it's just like, they're not being shut down. Like, okay, they're playing decent yeah. defense. Melo could play decent defense too, and he brings a whole lot more offensively anyway. Bro, uh, and he, <laughs> Rosen gives us 20, like 20 points, but he does it on nine shots. I just saw That's that. He's getting efficient on us. On top oh, of that, he drops 11 times. What is DeRozan? Steve, Na <laughs> Steve Nash out there. <laughs> Like he's always dropping dimes on us like that. Yeah. Like now we gotta. So if we're not gonna do that, okay, cool. Let's go ahead and outscore them. Right. Yeah. And that yo, that's what they were doing in the bubble, like outscoring them. The final scores of the games. Remember that shit it was like one thirty to one twenty eight. I know it was nerve wracking for you. Every game, I was like, yo, can we win a game double bro. double digits at least, bro? By nine at least. Is that too much to ask? Or we were winning last minute, but it was fun. It was some it of was. the most fun basketball I was watching. For sure. I uh, I think I've told this this story real quick on the podcast, but I don't know if you heard it. Yo, that last game versus the versus the Nets. Remember when like if they lost they were out, if they won they were in. Bro, when Melo missed that shot with like 15 seconds left, and Karis Levert comes down and like yeah. could win the game, the Blazers were up by one. They could. I just literally wanted win to the say game. sorry, Ennis when Panther, I tell I'm you, like, at you in your eyes right I now. was sitting shaking uh, like a you've been fucking killing I just, on both ends I was last seeing night, shit even before my eyes like. <laughs> like I have to, I have to recontrol everything. Like all the work that I just did over the last year, it's 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 over. Like I'm over. gonna have to restart. I might have to like shut shut it down. Like it might be a wrap. So yeah, yeah that's it why was, uh... I personally, I'm a Levert fan now because Levert had his, <laughs> our fate in his palm, bro. Yes, he all he had to do, all he had to do was drive to the lane. He settled, he settled, bro. But if Levert would have drove to the lane, bro, we would have missed the bubble playoff, and he would have. Yeah. All he had to do was get fouled because we probably would have fouled him, bro. He was unstoppable that night. <laughs> yeah. We would have knocked down one free throw. But thank you, LeVert. I know you're out indefinitely bro, because of a, a terrible injury right now. But thank you, bro, for not uh, <laughs> settling and for not driving to the lane, bro. Bro. And, and like, especially because Melo missed that shot right before. Yeah. Like, if Melo, yeah. if that was Dame who missed it, CJ who missed it, like, obviously, I would have still been bugging out. But, yeah, just their season ending on a Melo missed three, like an open look, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would have uh that would that would have been a tough one for me, but um yeah. anyway, bro. All right, we just uh got to the end of this podcast. Been going for forty two minutes now. So at the end of each podcast, we allow everybody to just control a narrative. Doesn't have to be sports related. Doesn't have to be mellow related. Can be literally anything that you want. Um, so I'm gonna give you the floor and let you control a narrative. Man, I so I'm I'm definitely gonna keep it home with mellow with them, bro. I'm gonna just control this now. So I don't know about you, but I'm constantly finding myself to debate uh, with people about how great he is and he was. Why? I mean, at this point, it's almost like a, a pity first ballot Hall of Famer, uh, like notification people give us now. It's like, yeah, 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 you know, he'll be in this, like almost like Vince Carter, right? But I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand what he's doing. Real quick, Steve, where is he ranked in the all time? Is he 15, 14? 14. 14. 14. 14, right? And so if he averages, um, let's say he stays at 12, what? He'll move up at least one more spot? He's going to be top 10 if he averages 12. Okay, got you. Cool. So, season, yeah. yeah, top 10 score of all time, right? Not to mention, like, he's had some injuries. He's missed some seasons. And then he missed the season with Houston. That, just, that, that was just terrible. But, like, that 2012-2013 season, I don't understand. I don't think we understand how great it was, bro. LeBron James was going to be the first unanimous MVP. He was like, people are pissed that Steph Curry has that, that little title, right? The only unanimous it. MVP. LeBron James was supposed to get it. But listen, let me tell you why it was not stupidity off that one voter. It was not dumb. Carmelo Anthony should have, he got one vote and he should have gotten more. He, first of all, Carmelo beat the Miami Heat four times that season. 
He swept the Miami Heat all four times on top of dropping 50 points on Shane Battier's head. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was all jumpers. On was jumpers, all jumpers. Yeah. He didn't even drive to the lane, bro. It was all jumpers. <laughs> and so, you know, he takes this New York team that had get that had, you know, wasn't getting uh a lot of success before, and then definitely hasn't seen that type of success since then. He brought life to the garden. Um, uh, he came back home. He stayed in New York uh, when 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 all of the um, all of the criticism was on him. When Phil Jackson even came to town and and was criticizing their best player and stuff. Um, I don't think we understand like how great he is. I know we I know we love Harden right now. We think he's the greatest offensive weapon that we've seen in a long time. But Carmelo was that, bro. He was that before obviously Curry came and revolutionized the game the three-pointer. But we're talking about you want to go ahead and get a bucket. You need a bucket anywhere on the floor, any green light. Carmelo has that, bro. And so um I just think that he's obviously had some bad luck with the draft, right? If he goes to Detroit and he wins that championship that first year, we're having a different conversation. We have a different name for this podcast. You know what I'm saying? Like the podcast is something else. We don't it's have a to goat combo at that point. Yeah, it's the goat. You know what I'm saying? Because he's gonna he's gonna win one his first year, and then heck, they go back again and they play his first. And he might have he he could have easily gotten to that starting lineup. You don't know. Like he like he was going to be able to go ahead and and have rings before Dwayne Wade ends up getting his, and definitely before LeBron gets his. And then uh, and then Carmelo actually has freedom now to move he wants right he doesn't have to necessarily chase certain situations but um but you know it's it's just certain things that just don't go their way obviously he runs into prime kobe in the western conference finals and then oklahoma city like i like i said i watched every game and this is gonna sound really crazy but i do think that if um roberson if roberson does not get injured this is crazy people laugh at me when i say this because Roberson is like quote unquote terrible, but I'm trying to tell you, bro, they were on fire. They were on fire, OKC. And if Roberson doesn't go down, bro, Oklahoma will beat Utah, and they end up in and end up, you know, putting things in places. Then that Oklahoma City, uh, and real quick, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm gonna finish off this. <laughs> I hate the narrative that Carmelo Anthony was the reason why things didn't work out in Oklahoma. Paul George who you paid a lot of money for, scores five points in an elimination game. Not to mention he's freaking getting killed by the guy that works at Publix, Mr. Joe Ingles, <laughs> and he's getting lit up every day, bro. On top of that, Russell, Wils- Russell Westbrook is getting lit up by Donovan Mitchell. But you know who he wants to focus on? He wants to focus on Rubio. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and shut him down. No, no, you need to worry about this 19-year-old that's giving you 25 and 10. And so Carmelo obviously is getting taken out of game for defensive assignments. And the, the narrative is like, yo, he was the reason why it didn't work. And then you obviously see the next year it didn't work for those guys either. But, oh. um, player, man, I, I, you know, favorite – my, my all-time favorite play in any sport. Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully Portland gets it gets it together. Melo gets um, adjusted into the lineup and gets a lot more opportunities and minutes. And he does what he's been doing, bro. He's year 18. And besides LeBron, nobody from his class is around. None. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. yeah. Well said, bro. Well, yo. Appreciate uh, you taking some time out and hopping on. I know you probably have a crazy busy schedule. Why don't you quickly like drop your ads, like yeah. Spotify, whatever, whatever you want to let people know. Yo, where yo, yo, I want to go ahead and uh, hear more about Loso. I'm a battle rapper um, on the biggest platform called Ultimate Rap League. So you go ahead and follow me uh, at my website, everythingloso.com. You just go to that website and you can find my Spotify, my Apple Music. You can follow my Instagram, my Twitter on there. Um, see previous battles. Um, and I'll be also uh, starting up a podcast myself called Everything Low. So very, very soon, which will oh. be on as well. So, so salute to Control the Narrative Brand. Thank you guys so much, man. Love it. My favorite, favorite, favorite account to follow, man. Appreciate y'all. Oh, appreciate you, bro. We'll uh, we'll be seeing you around Instagram and shit in the comment section. Always, always. <laughs> appreciate your time, homie. Yes, sir. <laughs>